Murthy, very dynamic and very active uh, chairman, uh, academic and research committee of AIOS, and a very accomplished cataract and refractive surgeon from uh, Eye Foundation, Coimbatore. And she's going to be talking about cataract surgery in small eyes. Uh, thank you, Namrita and the entire AOS for this uh, wonderful opportunity to be amongst uh, great speakers. And uh, there was so much of learning which happened to me. I couldn't find myself even getting up for a moment from my chair. So without ado, I'll be talking on cataract surgery and small eyes. There's not much gymnastics that I'm showing here. Uh, for the anatomical configuration of these eyes and the proximity of all the structures and the fact that they share the microcirculation, any impact on one would affect the other. And we actually, if you look at the anatomy of these eyes, they could be just a normal eye, small eye, with a normal anterior uh, chamber depth and a normal axial length. It could be a microphthalmic eye where the anterior chamber depth is normal, but the axial length is smaller. It could be a nanophthalmic eye where both the anterior chamber depth and the axial length is small, or it could be a relative anterior microphthalmus where the anterior chamber depth alone is smaller, but the axial length is normal. So then there are so many uh, combinations which can happen, and this is what is going to challenge you during your surgery. And so you need to be aware of the challenges which come here. Besides these anatomical configuration, you could have a low endothelial count in some of these eyes with even Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Needless to say, because of the small configuration, there's going to be angle crowding, there could be a glaucoma, there could be an increased risk of iris prolapse because just make an incision to start your cataract surgery and because of the um, uh, tensed eyeball, you could have the iris coming out. You could get uveal effusions more so in nanophthalmic eye where the thickened sclera can press on the vortex veins and you could have an uveal effusion. The very fact that you make an incision, the small eyes, the hypotony itself can create a uveal effusion. The other challenges here is the IOL power challenges. Now, we, it goes without saying that in a small eye, a hypropic eye, you're going to use a large part IOL. And when you know that in extremes of axial length, as was so beautifully discussed earlier, the main difficulty is difficulty in predicting the ELP. Now, already, as I had said, we do not know in a short eye whether it's a normal anterior chamber depth or a shallow anterior chamber depth. And there's going to be so much of challenges in the biometry. But the very fact that you're implanting a large part IOL, a small change, can create a huge refractive surprise. And that is why the average, uh, the third generation formulas work well in normalized and normal corneas, but you need to go on to the newer generation formulas for these extremes of axial length. And the very fact is because they use more variables in, in predicting the ELP, because of that, they outperform the formulas. They even take into account the principal planes, which was discussed earlier, the small changes in the geometry and the principal planes which change. All these also have a role to play in predicting the LP and getting closer to target emetropia. Preoperatively, of course, you need to soften the eye. You need to use preoperative mantol, glycerol, massage. And where is the role of sclerostomy? Like there has been a good study, a, a mini more randomized control study, where they say that doing a prophylactic sclerostomy in an anophthalmic eyes is equivocal, like even with or without the patients do well, but just to understand how to do it very briefly, you need to expose the eye at least 12 millimeter away from the limbus and you make an incision, create a four by four scleral uh, flap first primarily, and then go and make an incision on the deeper uh, uh, sclera once you've exposed that area. And then you make a small incision till you come to the suprachoroidal space. And you could even cauterize that incision so that it continues to game. And then you can close the incision. You have just created the sclerostomy in case of a need of uveal fusion. Intraoperatively, as has been uh, earlier told by me, it's going to be a crowded anterior chamber. Now, these eyes can dilate poorly because of the atrophy of the dilator pupillae or because of the need of uh, using meiotic agents on a long-term basis, iris prolapse. So you need all those magical iris hooks and rings, which uh, Sue and discussed. But is there a role of limited anterior vitrectomy? I would say it should be best avoided in a small eye because we do not know anatomically where the pass planar is exactly situated. Now, this is an eye which is again a hypro for plus six diopter hyperopia. And 
what we need to do is you need to make your incision not too posterior so that you don't have iris prolapse. You need to inject cohesive viscoelastic. You need to create a nice biplanar incision. You want a good wound construction. These are small eyes and you need to have a large enough rexus. And this is a significantly hard cataract, but you don't want, of course, to be too large. Gentle hydro, you don't want the to iris to prolapse and you to need to keep decompressing it. You need to ensure that the nucleus is rotating well. You need to look into the parameters. You can't have very low flow parameters because it's a small eye because you need to deal with a hard nucleus. So a good uh, 700 vacuum or a IOP being stable in these Centurion machines is a great advantage. You can see I'm trying to chop it, but there is not even a flutter in the anterior chamber. Sometimes essentially you need to fracture that posterior plate in these dense cataracts. Sometimes it doesn't get cut one in one go. You could do a multi-level chopping too. You could keep injecting viscoelastic to coat the endothelium. But the fact that the anterior chamber continues to be stable and the fact that you're not using any ultrasound but just playing around with the fluidics tells you that how well the eye cornea is going to be protected in these signs. And of course, just enough viscoelastic so that you don't over distend the eye. And then the only challenge here is, of course, besides again reconfirming the parameters, is getting the first piece out. And once you've got the first piece out in this jigsaw puzzle, then it becomes quite easy because you have more working space. But the only thing which we need to uh, tell that you have to inject viscoelastic and especially when it comes to the large last pieces because these capsules can be thin it could get trampoloning into the eye now this is a mid dilated pupil which i had discussed earlier about which could happen in a small eye but besides the reasons which are there sometimes there could be a posterior sinica behind the uh, iris and in this situation it might be difficult to insinuate your iris retractor so if you go into the side port and just inject a little bit of viscoelastic then it gives you space to inject the, the place the iris hooks as you need but again, once you have, you know, the usual diamond shape or rhomboid configuration, whichever way you want to place it, you could do it. But then uh, what I want to uh, show you that in a small eye, what is uh, a small challenge is like um, when you are taking in your phaco probe, you can see how the iris gets tented and you need to use your second instrument to push back this iris. Otherwise, you would end up with an iridodialysis. It's a fairly soft cataract, nothing much to say, but only thing you need to have low flow parameters because you could go into just a partial occlusion and you could cheese wire the nuclear uh, matter and then you may not get that kind of purchase on the nucleus and not be able to chop it adequately. Otherwise, it's just a, a, a routine uh, case to show and moves on conveniently as you go on. But one way of dealing with what I had told you earlier on you could actually make a sub-incisional uh, 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 hook here and then place another side, uh, uh, another iris hook here. And then now you can see that you have made your incision uh, between these two iris hooks. And then when you take your phaco probe, there is no tenting in, the, in this place. The other challenge in a small eye is if it is very small residual area, you could do your bioptics on the cornea if the corneal thickness allows. You could do a piggyback lens or nowadays you have these customized IOLs, but only thing we need to be conscious is the huge spherical abrasions which can happen in these very large part IOLs. Now, this was an immersion biometry which tells you two different IOL parts. And then I did a variant and then decided to implant a 40 diopter IOL. So, in, of course, I ended up with a plus six diopter of residual. You need to could use an Ichaman's nomogram and wherein you uh, multiply it by 1.5 and it comes to nine diopters. So here what, in, uh, what is that you have these sulcoflex lenses. Ideal thing is to use a lens of a different material from what the primary lens is, a hydrophilic. Use a large optic of a piggyback. The advantage is if you won't get a pupillary block and you won't have that uh, photoptic uh, symptoms and the indulating haptics of these sulcoflex lens allows the IOL to be very stably seated and the posterior concave surface also will prevent interlenticular uh, opacification and you have got yourself bailed out of this situation. This is the last case, a very small eye, 16.5 uh, meter axial length. So the challenge is, of course, a small pass planar vitrectomy had to be done. And then the usual way of uh, doing a, a just a right size rexis and a very slow motion uh, phaco emulsification and protecting the endothelium. And there was cornea was also not clear in this particular case. So you need to have an endo illuminator to help you visualize. You, most importantly, you need to enlarge the incision when it comes to customized IOLs. 
which is what I wanted to convey when you're talking about uh, doing a cataract surgery in a small eye. And then you need to suture up the main wound and also that port where you, did, uh, you have a, a past planovitrectomy. So I would like to conclude stating that a surgery in a small eye is just a fake emulsification, but it mandates that you do a pre-op concentration, intra-op detailing. Uh, you also have a management strategic backup plan because when you do it all, then you arrive at a final optimal outcome as you need to do in all your cataract surgery cases. Thank you very much.